It is nine o'clock, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going to give um, latecomers five minutes grace. So we'll start in five minutes. I think the proceedings last night might have affected one or two. So we'll, um, we'll hang on for five minutes.
Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we'll start the proceedings officially. Um, welcome to this second day of the Media Summit on Climate Change and Disaster Risk Reduction. We will be conducting affairs here for just for this morning before we turn into the second chapter of the conference. So, as you can see, um, Hashimoto-san and his team are coming to the stage. Um, it does say in the notes of introduction uh, that NHK will share its immense experience and know-how of disaster broadcasting with us. Well, having had the privilege of seeing and listening to this presentation, this masterclass in the past, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, may I say that this will be immense. It's, it's a very impressive presentation, let me assure you. Um, so I think that I shall hand over to Hashimoto immediately. Um, please bear with us. Uh, as people will arrive late, I think that the celebrations last night of the welcoming dinner are still having the after effects. Um, so again, thank you who have been, for you who are here at the moment for, for being prompt. Um, and what we will do is that we'll probably have an hour, an hour and 15 of presentation, and the last 15, 20 minutes will be a Q&A. So if you have your questions uh, at the end, uh, we will come to you as soon as we can. Um, so for now, let me hand over to Hashimoto and, and his team. Hashimoto-san, thank you. Okay, so please give me the screen. Good morning. Uh, hello, ABU colleagues. Good, uh, welcome to NHK Masterclass today. My name is Akinori Hashimoto. I am moderating this session. Um, I have been working for NHK for 37 years, and most of the time, I was a news reporter, mainly covering disasters and international news. Today, I would like to express my heartful appreciation to FBC and Fiji TV and the government of Fiji to host this great event. I also appreciate the Secretariat, ABU Secretariat, uh, who contributed to this uh, preparation. In this session, I would like to share our experience in disaster reporting. Uh, let me start my presentation with this video. The worst earthquake in recorded history happened on March 11, 2011. The magnitude 9.0 quake struck off the coast of the northeastern region of Tohoku. It unleashed a towering tsunami that slammed into seaside cities and towns. Approximately 20,000 people died in the tsunami. Every year, natural disasters such as flooding and landslides devastate communities across Japan. Two major weather events in 2014 killed dozens of people. In August, more than 200 millimeters of rain fell on Hiroshima during the course of two hours. The storm hit a limited area, roughly 20 kilometers wide by 5 kilometers long. Water-soaked hillsides gave way, sending a torrent of mud into parts of the city. 74 people died. Torrential rainfall last summer also caused major damage in other cities, including Tokyo, Osaka, and Kyoto. Experts blame these intense localized storms on rising global temperatures. Warmer air sucks up more water vapor into clouds. Forecasters expect this extreme weather to occur with greater frequency and ferocity. <laughs> Active volcanoes pose a very real threat to Japan, too. Last September, the country experienced its worst volcanic disaster in nearly 80 years. The eruption of Mount Ontake resulted in a total of 63 dead and missing. The 
the number of casualties was high because many climbers were hiking the mountain to enjoy the view of the colorful autumn foliage. As you saw, Japan is really prone to natural disasters. Unlucky to say, Japan is a kind of department store of natural disasters. We have been experiencing record-breaking downpours more frequently. Disaster risks are getting bigger than ever. Experts say global warming could be the reason. And furthermore, seismic activity have been increasing around Japan after the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. So, disaster reporting is becoming even more important mission for broadcasters in Japan. This is a public opinion survey which NHK conducted in 2015. We asked how people obtain information in time of disaster. 80% replied television, and 66% replied radio. This shows how much Japanese people trust traditional broadcasting in time of disaster. To meet this expectation, NHK puts top priority to contribute to safer, more secure communities through expanded reporting aimed at preventing disasters in its corporate plan. We function as an information infrastructure for disaster risk reduction in Japanese society. The principle of NHK's disaster reporting is quite simple. To prevent and mitigate damage. That is, quite different from reporting the result of disaster after it happened. To realize this principle, there are four keys in our mind. Number one, real-time early warning. Number two, real-time news gathering. And number three, multimedia dissemination. And number four, uh, programs to learn lessons. In this session, Mr. K. Oharu will talk about real-time early warning and real-time news gathering as part one. And Mr. Kazuhiko Yamashita will talk about multimedia dissemination as part two. And Mr. Tomohiro Inoue will talk about programs to learn lessons as part three. After those presentations, we will have a time for questions and answers. Please raise your hand and make questions or give your comments. Now let's move to the part one, Mr. K. Oharu. Thank you, Mr. Hashimoto, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hello, I'm Kei Ohara from NHK. Sorry. And for the past four years, I have been in charge of reporting and supervising disaster coverage as a news editor. As you saw in the opening video, natural disasters have been occurring every year in Japan and they are intensifying. So it has become all the more important for NHK to inform the public dangers in real time to save as many lives as possible. One of the most important tasks in disaster reporting 
is how fast we can disseminate early warnings and evacuation notices issued by disaster authorities. In Japan, most of the disaster information is issued by the Japan Meteorological Agency, JMA, which is a governmental agency. The JMA monitors typhoons, torrential rains, earthquakes, tsunamis, and volcanic activity 24-7, and issues various kinds of information, including warnings for torrential rains and typhoons, warnings for earthquakes and tsunamis, and warnings for volcanic eruptions. NHK is linked online to the JMA, and we receive and disseminate the warnings they issue in real time. For example, this is an earthquake early warning on the screen. The JMA picks up sign of the first small tremor, and when they assess that it may turn into a large tremor, they issue this warning. この緊急地震速報です。ミスズ強い揺れに警戒してください。緊急地震速報です。NHK and this screen shows seismic intensity by municipalities. Within two minutes from the earthquake, seismic intensity of each area is shown on the screen. Furthermore, within five minutes of an earthquake, the screen displays the time of occurrence, magnitude, epicenter, and the detailed seismic intensity in the various regions automatically. In a new studio, the presenter has a system at hand that automatically shows a script based on the information from the JMA. Moreover, if there is a possibility of tsunami caused by a large earthquake occurring in the sea, a tsunami warning or advisory is issued. There are three levels of tsunami warning and advisory according to its height. When the major tsunami warning or tsunami warning is issued, NHK calls evacuation for the resident along the coast immediately. We are also working on how to improve the dissemination of disaster information. It began with the massive earthquake and tsunami seven years ago. Actually, there was a time lag of 20 minutes to two hours from the time of the earthquake to the time of the first tsunami wave hitting the coast. During the time, NHK sent out warnings to the residents living in the coastal areas repeatedly, though television and through television and radio. But in the end, 18,000 people fell victim by, to, by the tsunami. Learning from this experience, we at NHK have made major changes in the evacuation call. Usually, NHK announcers present the news in a calm manner. But in the event of imminent danger, such as a major tsunami warning, a stronger tone will be used. Please note the change in the tone of the announcer's presentation at the time of the Great East Japan earthquake and now. By delivering information accurately and calling on the viewers to evacuate in forceful words, we aim to avoid any misunderstanding and thus to save as many lives as possible. Now, 
We have also improved our screen presentation. We are now using bigger fonts and simple wording. Our top priority is to have the people watching television understand the imminent danger and determine that evacuation is necessary. Information on increased dangers of heavy rainfall, floods, and landslide are also automatically covered into written form and reported promptly through television, subtitles, and radio. NHK has set standards of operation as to when and to what extent emergency warnings should be issued. As for emergencies such as massive earthquakes or when the major tsunami warning or tsunami warning has been issued, programs of all television and radio channels are interrupted and replaced with a special disaster broadcast. In addition to the warnings issued by the JMA, we also swiftly disseminate the vacation notice given by local governments. Recently, information announced by local governments are connected through a common online platform. With this L alert system, disaster information is shared and can be used by the media, communication com companies, and others. By the end of the fiscal year, the service will be available in 45 out of 47 prefectures nationwide. And we are also working on showing real-time images to swiftly convey what is happening. NHK has set up robot cameras in around 700 locations across Japan. They are connected by the internet. Images can be broadcast in real time and can be saved for three days. They are used for earthquakes, tsunamis, typhoons, or heavy rains. Furthermore, we have 15 helicopters on standby at 12 airports across Japan. In the event of a disaster, an incident or an accident, the helicopters fly to the scene and send the image at once. We have also worked on developing technology to immediately show images of earthquakes or heavy rainfall when they occur. In the past, an outside broadcast ban was needed for live coverage. But now, simple equipment that fit inside a backpack is all that is needed. Moreover, live live coverage can be done with an iPhone. We use an application called Streambox app for broadcasting. And this is a live image of a flood that occurred on the outskirts of Tokyo three years ago. The picture quality is not as good, but it's not for an initial report. At present, all 2,400 reporters and cameramen carry an iPhone installed with the app, so they are always prepared. In addition, we are developing new types of robot cameras equipped with solar panels and wind-powered generator. They continue to work even when the power supply is cut off by a earthquake or tsunami. <laughs> And this robot camera is e equipped with the Sony digital camera. It enables high sensitivity filming even at night. It can be placed in dangerous places. It is highly mobile and can operate unmanned, so it can be used in places such as large-scale landslide sites. And this, is, this is a video of the eruption of Mount Sakurajima on August 17th, 2015, taken by a personal robot camera. And NHK actively uses images submitted by our viewers for disaster reporting. 
when we received compelling images from people who were at the scene, we broadcast it with the sender's permission. In disaster reporting, it is also important how to provide disaster information in real time. Especially in recent years, we have entered a new phase in handling disasters brought about by heavy rains. It began with the intense torrential rain that occurred in Hiroshima City four years ago in August. In just two hours, the region had over 200 millimeters of rainfall, and successive mudslides killed 74 people. The rain fell in a small area of five kilometers by 20 kilometers. The JMA couldn't predict the scope of the torrential rains and the warnings were not issued in time. If we wait for the information to be announced, it will be too late to call out for evacuations. One of the measures we have introduced for this type of down power is a 10 minutes rainfall observation. At NHK, we collect rainfall data from the JMA every 10 minutes and rank them. Also, three years ago, the JMA began showing weather radar images of rainfall every five minutes on their website. This is what the high-resolution precipitation nowcast screen looked like. Rainfall observation is conducted by high-performance radar, and the screen indicates the amount of rainfall per a 250-meter square area. Furthermore, it displays a forecast of where the rain will head in the coming hour. When we conclude, though there is various forms of data, through these various forms of data that continued rainfall in one area could turn into torrential rains and cause a disaster. We send out warnings to local residents through the various news or special news programs. And we also use social media to gather real-time disaster information. We have set up a social listening team to monitor Twitter and other forms of social media 24-7. When there are numerous reports of the disaster, the reports are broadcast after the editors verify them. Even so, there is a head-aching issue we must tackle to prevent damages caused by disasters. That is, how to make the public realize that the disaster information is relevant to them. Frankly, this is the most difficult problem. In August 2016, Typhoon Lion Rock directly hit the northern part of Japan. In the town Iwaizumi of Iwate Prefecture, a town with a population of a little over 4,000, the Omoto River flooded leaving 21 elderly people dead and two missing. In fact, from the previous day, the JMA had announced that a typhoon would directly hit the region and the considerable damage was anticipated. They called on residents to be on close alert. On the on that morning, NHK also changed the scheduled programs and broadcast a special program on the typhoon so we can transmit information on a 24-hour basis and call the public to be on high alert. But the resident didn't sense the impending crisis. About two months after the devastation from the typhoon, I went to the site and talked to the resident. Many of them judged from their past experiences and didn't expect the typhoon to be so damaging. Or because the warnings were called out to a broad area, 
they baselessly thought that their own area was safe. Therefore, from last summer, we have started a new project to improve public awareness. On July 5th last year, northern part of Kyushu was hit by historical torrential rain. Our reporter directly makes commentaries on which area on which area is facing the potential dangers based on the real-time information provided by the JMA. See this video. Last June, severe torrential rain attacked the northern part of Kyushu. More than 40 people died or went missing, and more than 3,000 houses were destroyed. NHK started real-time risk analysis based on the latest weather information provided by the National Disaster Authorities through the online network. This is the flood risk map of the area. The levels of risk are indicated by using different colors. The rivers in purple face high risk of flooding. The darker the purple color, the higher the risk. ここに、えー、サタ川という川があります、はい、例えばこの川ですとすでに、えー、水位は急上昇しておりまして、えー、避難判断水位をもう超えていますま、うん、もなく氾濫危険水位に達しようとするところですで住宅もありますのでこういったところを溢れますと一気に浸水が広がる恐れがありますので、うんえー、安全の確保が重要です Our reporter in charge of disasters analyzes current and potential risk of disaster areas, specifying individual names of towns and rivers. This is the landslide risk map, based on information from JMA. We are making extra efforts to call on people to evacuate as soon as possible by providing specific risk information in detail. For regular news broadcast by announcer, which include reporting and writing script, the information becomes 30 minutes to an hour old. With a direct explanation by a reporter, we can save time and convey to our viewers what is happening nearly in real time. But for the public to be able to recognize the danger and to evacuate properly, it is necessary for each person to clearly know the existing risks of the areas in which they live. That will be discussed in part three later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oharu. Now we have learned this. To save lives of audience, we need real-time disaster reporting based on the real-time information and pictures. That is very fundamental concept of our disaster reporting. Now, let's move to the next part two. Recently, our industry has been going to digital. In disaster reporting, the role of internet is also becoming more important. Mr. Kazuhiro Yamashita has more to tell you. Just a moment. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I, my name is Kazuhiko Yamashita. I'm a senior producer in the news department, network and digital news division at NHK. I'm in charge of the online news, social media, mobile app development, and sometimes I appear on camera as a TV reporter. Look at this. Anyway, during a disaster, yeah, delivering information to people in need is essential. In order to save lives, it is crucial to use any and all kinds of available means. As you know, Japan is one of the world's most 
earthquake prone countries in the world. Japan has done more than most when it comes to disaster preparedness, and we have become a world leader in readiness. So I'm here to talk about the multimedia platform disaster coverage we have developed at NHK. The turning point for us was the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. Utilizing live footage, we were able to immediately begin broadcasting on their information about the earthquake and tsunami. However, we did discover that the medium of television does have a weakness. After the disaster, there was a constant need for vital information to be delivered and updated. Information about lifelines and restoration dependent on the locations and extent of damage. NHK struggled to deliver as much detailed information on air as possible, but due to the fact that there was so much information that needed to be communicated. It was difficult. Please look at this. We used three layered L shaped caption. The outer edge indicated information concerning the Fukushima area. Next, the middle layer was for the Tohoku area. Tohoku is northern Japan. And the inside layer was for Tokyo, from Tokyo headquarters. We ended up with a visually complicated screen, but it was our last result. There was just too much information to deliver via a TV screen. In Tohoku area, the program presenting restoration information was aired daily, but sometimes it took half of the program time to convey the available water stations, which meant people had to sit and wait in front of TV until the information they were seeking was broadcast. So the Great East Japan earthquake offered NHK the challenge of developing viable multimedia platform. Twitter was just beginning to find popularity in Japan at that time. So NHK tweeted disaster information from several accounts. This is a tweet used to alert people right after the earthquake it was met with a very big response. Using another Twitter account, there was one person in charge of delivering lifeline info, support, care, and emergency service. It was me. I delivered information as to which hospitals in Sendai City was able to accept injured patients. However, because there was only one staff person using the Twitter account, and we could not deliver the information systematically. And what we delivered was restricted. Another challenge we were faced with was live streaming our program via internet. We were able to do this by cooperating with Ustream, YouTube, and Yahoo. But actually, this service was instigated due to feedback from our viewers. It was initiated by a middle school student from Hiroshima who was filming the TV screen and streaming it online. There was a huge response to his efforts, so NHK began delivering it officially online. The internet became a valuable tool for gathering information. One person had been left behind at the disaster area was able to tweet for help. Even though the telephone line were unable to cope with the aftermath of the crisis. In Tokyo, all transportation had been halted, and the city was full of a person trying to get home, even if they had to walk all the way. A Yokohama nursery school used Twitter to inform children's parents that could not be reached via phone in order to let them know their children were safe. The Japanese people and NHK experienced a number of things during the Great East Japan earthquake. And one of these was that not only is there a need for broadcasting, 
but it is also vital to incorporate multimedia platforms like the internet and mobile devices to deliver the necessary information to people in need. A multimedia platform strategy delivers precise information for each region and to all people with speed and accuracy. Now, I would like to introduce NHK's news and disaster app that we created in 2016. Information is automatically updated 24-7. The information delivered is based on data from NHK's news and disaster information and the reliable disaster authorities. The app is free and is available for iOS and Android. I'm sure that you have seen and maybe used many different apps for news and ones for disaster prevention, but this app is unique because it is not just a news app. It also incorporates disaster prevention and support. In Japan, disaster prevention is a part of our daily life, and this app provides information that is helpful for daily living as well as I mean disaster. News, disaster information with a focus, maps, and video are all bundled into one. Reliability is guaranteed since this app is made by the public broadcaster, NHK. And now let's look at this video. Once again, these uh, main functions. Most important is uh, disaster information. It is provided as soon as possible with visual images for earthquake, tsunami, and typhoon updates. Data from the Japan Meteorological Agency is automatically updated on the app, on the app, which means that the data on the app is the same as the information we used for our broadcast. Disaster information can also be viewed on the map, earthquakes and tsunamis. It also reveals where the rain clouds are, and the map can be enlarged in order to establish locations precisely. And typhoon weather warning on the map. On non-disaster days, weather forecasts are available. And in hot weather, heat stroke alerts. This boy is screaming, very hot. We post detailed weather alerts and evacuation information for each area. There is also evacuation information supplied by different cities with evacuation instructions for residents during a disaster. And three locations can be registered in advance with this app. One, the place you live. Two, the place your parents live. And three, the place your children live. Also, the GPS system detects you, uh, where you are and supplies you with the information concerning the area you are in. And by accessing the news app, you can check for news updates. These days, the situation on the Korean Peninsula is a major concern in Japan. The biggest benefit of this app are its push notification, messages that are pushed from an application to user interface, breaking news, earthquake Britons, tsunami and weather warning, as well as dispatch information from the local authorities is immediately distributed based on data from NHK and disaster authorities. Live streaming is also a major strength of this app. 
as in case of disaster like an earthquake or typhoon, we can deliver the televised broadcast. We can also stream images from robot camera in various locations. During a typhoon, viewers can see the rain falling and check out the area where landslides have occurred. We also stream broadcasts other than disasters, such as President Trump's visit to Japan or helicopter ride to see a beautiful sunrise. And recently, a streaming of the baby panda proved too to be very popular. These are main functions. Let's look at next video. 去年7月の九州北部豪雨後部座席から撮影した様子です撮影したさざ波さんは福岡市内から熊本の自宅に帰る途中道路沿いの川が増水し大きな不安に襲われていましたこのまま帰れなかったらどうしようっていうような感じでした移動中さざ波さんを支えたのが NHK ニュース防災アプリでしたこのアプリでは地図上で自分のいる場所と雨雲の状況を表示今後1時間の雨雲の動きまで確認することができますここまで行けばきっと大丈夫っていうのをこうスマホ見ながら行けたんでそれを信じてこう帰ってこれた感じがします安心を届ける NHK ニュース防災アプリ This app was created two years ago in June. We update it regularly. It has been downloaded by millions of users and was awarded a best app at the Google App Store. NHK World App is the English version that is available. And now, let's look at another multimedia platform we use, social media. We began this official NHK Twitter account in March 2011, just one week before the great earthquake. We now have over 800,000 followers. Our specialty is that we provide people with immediate and prompt information. Of course, we tweet more frequently during a disaster. During a torrential rain in eastern Japan, someone who had been left behind and was in danger due to a flooding river sent out a tweet. NHK's social listening team found the tweet, contacted the person, and was able to gather information about the situation. It was broadcast on air and online as well. This is NHK's multimedia platform for gathering disaster information. These days, ways to receive information has diversified, and needs during crisis have broadened. Nevertheless, during severe and extreme circumstances, media must be able to deliver information to all of those in need, no matter who they are or where they are. People in all places, people seeking various information. We want to deliver information by any means possible. And it must be fast and accurate as well. In conclusion, I'd like to share a tweet that I received from user during the Great East Japan last week. This, I resume you are busy without any time to rest but as a public service broadcaster, please do your best. Everyone needs the correct information as fast as you can deliver it. What do you think about? We think of this as a starting point. And are we continuing to develop and our March media news delivery? Thank you. Thank you, Yamashita-san. We know that younger generation does not watch TV as much as our generation. But in time of disaster, we need 
to provide critical information for all generations equally. To do this, we must secure our access to the younger generation, younger people, through multimedia platform, including the internet and the social media. Now we move to the part three, different angle. How to learn lessons to save people from the future disasters. Mr. Tomohiro Inoue will tell you more. Thank you. Hi. Hello, everyone. I am Tomohiro Inoue, a senior producer of the science program division, program production department at NHK. Raising from the DNA in our cell to the end of the universe, we have been producing science programs on various themes. And I, I myself, have placed special importance on disaster science and have been pursuing this theme. Today, I would, like, I would like to talk about how we can build a resilient society against disasters. So, as broadcasters, what can we do to protect people from future disaster? The key word to this question is to fear correctly. You may think, what does it mean? Actually, this phrase is now our slogan when we make disaster prevention program at NHK. Yes, I think that these are the magic words that can change people's attitude towards disasters. Fear correctly. In the past, the basics of the disaster prevention programs were to study why a certain disaster happened. It is an inspection that comes after disasters. People thought if we understand the cause, we can cope with the next disaster. Yes, of course, it's correct to some extent. However, before I joined NHK, I was watching these programs as one ordinary viewer, and this question crossed my mind. Can we really cope with disasters this way? I mean, uh, inspection after disaster. At that time, I had been studying seismology at graduate school. My research team was Prediction of future mega quakes. Scientifically speaking, the exact same disaster will never strike the same place again. A new situation develops every time. That's why disaster happen. We cannot prepare for the next calamity by just inspecting past disasters, I saw. The Japanese society, including myself, became painfully aware of this fact when the great Hanshin Awaji earthquake destroyed the city of Kobe in 1995. The astounding power of the huge earthquake with its epicenter located almost directly beneath the city had never, see, never been seen before, and even seismologists were at a loss for words. The earthquake shows that people and society could not be saved by preparing from the calamities of the past. The lesson learned here was the importance to predict what kind of hazard would happen next, or in other words, conduct prior inspection. It is crucial to urge people to predict upcoming disasters and to be prepared for it. This strong resolution made me change direction from becoming a researcher, and I choose to work at NHK to produce such science TV programs. 
Soon after joining NHK, I proposed making a program that would inspect future disasters. However, my boss replied with this remark. Are you serious? Don't needlessly scare the public when nothing has happened, and when you don't even know if that calamity will occur. I felt myself against a huge wall. It would be too late to inspect the data after it had struck, don't you think so? But that was how the majority of people at NHK thought at that time. As a public broadcaster, they thought they shouldn't make programs that would fuel fear unnecessarily. Meanwhile, however, the scale of disaster was growing immensely. One example is the gigantic Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. The disaster dealt a great blow, and many member nations of the ABU were damaged severely. During this hazard, the unimaginable enormous tsunami was filmed by many people in many countries. With the cooperation of broadcasters in the disaster-stricken countries, NHK gathered much footage of the tsunami and made a feature program which introduced the horrifying events that happened at numerous places. Japan is prone to earthquake and had experienced tsunami numbers of times, but the size of this was unseen even by specialists. Researchers and Japanese people were all greatly frightened, but the Japanese did not fear correctly at this point. Why? Because people thought that the tsunami happened outside of Japan. Now, please take a look at this. These are pictures of the Indian Ocean tsunami. And these are the great tsunami of the Great East Japan earthquake seven years later. Both are surprisingly similar to each other, don't you think so? It means we were supposed to have known what would happen when a huge tsunami struck through watching much footage of the Indian Ocean tsunami. But still, we were unprepared for it. This is because we didn't relate to the fear as something that would attack us in real life. After this, at long last, there came the time when NHK was finally able to make a disaster prevention program on fearing correctly, which is this program called Mega Quake. It was broadcast in 2010 to commemorate the 15th anniversary of the Great Hanshin Awaji earthquake, aired as a full series program. Until then, the greatest earthquake disaster that Japan had experienced was the magnitude 7 quake of Hansin Awaji. Scientifically so, possibilities remained for quakes greater than magnitude 8 to occur. What would happen to Japan then? Yes, prior inspection of disasters. It was at this 15 years commemorations timing that we took, took up the challenge to produce a program that conduct, conducted prior inspection of disasters. Mega Quake was aired just one year before the magnitude nine greaters, Great East Japan earthquake struck, quite really unexpected. It was a mere coincidence but it seemed as though the program seemed to predict the future. After the great earthquake of 2011, 
this program became one of NHK's big titles that would be broadcast every year, changing its title to Mega Disasters and Mega Crisis. The international edition is released as Raging Earth. Let's take a look at this trailer. Raging Earth. This series explores mega disasters on a global scale. We travel the world to uncover the latest scientific findings. Using cutting edge CGI, we demonstrate the mechanisms behind these disasters. Episode one, extreme weather. Record-breaking rains and cold waves are occurring more frequently around the world. Abnormal changes in the atmosphere and the oceans are behind these phenomena. Episode 2, Super Typhoons. New research reveals what causes a typhoon's violent destructive power. Drastic changes in rising air currents play a key role. Episode 3, Giant Earthquakes. For the first time ever, state-of-the-art technology shows us what's happening inside the Earth. We examine the secrets behind the increasing intensity of earthquakes. Episode 4, Massive Volcanic Eruptions. Researchers now understand the movement of underground magma. Raging Earth. Witness the threat. This sounds like a horror movie. <laughs> By the way, as you saw, the purpose of mega series is to predict how severe the next disaster could be. We produce the programs based on this keyword, fear correctly. Even without past experiences, if you can predict future disasters scientifically and realistically, you can relate to it as something that would really happen to you and be aware of it. This is what peer correctly means. So how could we invoke real fear from a disaster that had not yet happened? Let me explain my, ex uh, uh, let me explain my experience of production of Mega Quake. The program I directed conveyed the threat of long period ground motions caused by huge quakes, which rocked high-rise buildings specifically. By that time, Japan had not experienced the damage caused by this type of ground motions. Then how can we fear it correctly? Step one, we first researched the similar disasters that happened in the past, which resulted in finding about curious shakes that only damaged skyscrapers in Mexico City in 1985. That was the only major damage caused by long field ground motions in the past. So we scientifically unveiled the mechanisms of how it occurred and identified what long field ground motion is. When we rediscovered the Mexico earthquake, Various footages of the damage taken by Mexican broadcasters provided to be very useful. Archival materials of broadcasters can be a key factor to find lessons of past disasters. So it is very important for us, for ABU members, to share such archive materials for each other. Step two. We tried to understand what it would be like if it occurred in Japan. 
What would happen, to happen if Tokyo were hit by long period ground motion caused by huge quakes in the future? Conditions would change according to cities, such as the structure of buildings, the foundations, and population, and so on. We verified how the disaster would change using scientific simulation. Lastly, step three, visualizing potential disasters is crucial. As you say, seeing is believing. People can really feel fear only when they see it with their own eyes. In order to achieve this, we visualize future potential disasters through large experiments or through simulations using CGI. You may think that this would be impossible for broadcasting stations lacking budget. Don't worry. These days, many researchers around the world are conducting impactful experiments or creating convincing CGs themselves. By utilizing material like these and adding commentary for better understanding is, in many cases, sufficient to convey fear. These three steps depend on scientist analysis and experimental result. To feel correctly, however, there is something more important that can be done only by broadcasters. Here, I would like to introduce a program called The Great Evacuation, which is an episode of Mega Disaster. Series. This shows the strength of broadcast. Mr. Oharu McCreek took part in the production and he will explain. I will sit to him, please. Thank you for the introduction. Now, I would like to introduce our program on the custom made evacuation. That is a project to make an evacuation plan which fits the need of individual resident who is facing the risk of great tsunami. We reported from Yai city of Shizuoka prefecture, a city facing the Pacific Ocean located approximately 105 kilometers west of Tokyo. In the near future, a massive tsunami may hit this area, and in the worst case scenario, 11,000 people are estimated to lose their lives. In the number five district near the coast, where approximately 3,000 people live, a tsunami is expected to hit the district in six minutes after an earthquake strikes, and that inundation levels will be three meters at most. After the massive earthquake of seven years ago, the city has built over 20 towers for tsunami evacuation and has designated tall buildings nearby as tsunami evacuation buildings. We had an expert from Kyoto University and 400 local high school students asked all the residents in the district how they would evacuate in the event of a massive earthquake. We received answers from 1,784 people, over half of its residents. As a result, we found that over 894 people, over half of the responders, respondents, would be swept away in a tsunami. The high school student noticed that there were many people who answered that they wouldn't evacuate to the nearest evacuation site from their homes. Upon further questioning, they found that each had their reason for doing so. This woman had experienced a night without shelter as a child when a river flooded after typhoon. That's why she chose to evacuate to a high school far away 
instead of a nearby facility rooftop without a roof. We found that if these people were to each evacuate to the nearest evacuation site, 286 more people could be saved. Even so, many people would still be caught in the tsunami. Then we put our focus on three-story buildings built with reinforced concrete or steel frames. From research conducted after the Great East Japan earthquake, researchers found that over 80% of these buildings were left intact when the flood water levels reached around three meters. We realized that by using these buildings, we could decrease the number of victims in Yai's city, in Yai's city. How many lives can be saved because of the evacuation zones? The high school team asked the residents to participate in an experiment. Yoshimitsu Tatara is 87 years old. His legs are weak, and he says he has given up evacuating. His closest evacuation site is the Tsunami Evacuation Tower. But because he has only two minutes to reach the tower, he feels that he will not be able to make it on time. So the high school team suggests that he instead go to a three-storied steel-framed building that is only 60 meters from his home. <laughs> will he be able to reach the new site within two minutes? ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっ
I would like to point out what I believe to be of great importance. Will careful preparation really save our lives when disaster actually strikes? The key to this is judgment weighs more than information. When a tsunami or strong typhoon is approaching, the role of the media is to transmit accurate information speedily and to urge people to evacuate. But simply urging people does not ensure safe evacuation. There may even be many cases where disaster information cannot be conveyed because of blackouts or disruption of the information network. In cases like these, individual correct judgment saves people's lives. For example, imagine you feel a strong quake at the seaside. How quickly will the tsunami re reach the coast? Which will be a safer escape by car or by foot? Or what would you do when a strong typhoon is approaching? The wind, rain, and the river current would become stronger. At what timing should you evacuate? When no one is there to tell you, you must make judgment yourself to survive, scientifically predicting what will happen next. This judgment can only be obtained through continuous scientific disaster education. Our enemy called disaster must be feared correctly and must be perceived accurately just because it's fearsome. To promote the importance of this, broadcasting can be a very effective tool since people access it daily. Just one broadcast will not convey this. We must repeat it over again. And we must communicate that if we fight without running away, there will always be a way to save our own lives. Fear causes people to want to know about it more seriously. And to reduce the fear, people will begin to prepare for it. This is the first step to disaster reduction. The role of broadcasters is not just to convey information. We should believe in the strength of broadcasting to produce the power in people to save their own lives in times of emergency. Thank you for your attention to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Inoue-san. It is our reason to exist to produce programs. Content is the king. To produce good programs, we need to cooperate with scientists. And sometimes we can do better than scientists using our close connection and engagement with the audience. The trust of audience is the source of our strength. Let me introduce you our website for disaster risk reduction. The website is called Bosai. That means disaster prevention in Japanese language. This website is an on-demand audio service of our Radio Japan. It provides know-how and lessons learned from Japanese uh, disasters in Japan for foreigners. So if you are interested, uh, please try it. OK, now let's move to the question and answer session. Please uh, give your name and your organization when you make a question. Now floor is yours.
Good morning, Johannes Schunter from UNDP in Fiji. Thanks so much. This was very, very interesting and very impressive. Uh, I have two questions. One is, how do you ensure that the journalists have the knowledge to actually interpret all those images that you produce, like the webcams and so on, um, to make really sense of it and explain it to the public appropriately without themselves being scientists? How do you train your journalists to interpret those scientific images? And second, are you able to use those that investigation of future disasters, as you mentioned it, to allocate funding, uh, to help the government allocate funding in advance so that funding is immediately available in the right place when a disaster strikes? Is, are you working on that financial front as well, or can you contribute? Thanks. Do you mean the prediction of financial assets? No. The if the prediction of disasters can help allocate uh, the financial flow of aid. Sorry, I, I cannot get the point. Sorry. Um, we know disasters will happen. Uh, money will be spent the moment the disaster is happening. But if we have information up front about how the disasters will look like, can we work together with government to make the allocation of that money more effective, to be right there, available the moment a disaster strikes. The before the disaster. Correct. Um, Correct. And the first question was about question. capacity of journalists to interpret scientific images. And about the first question about the news reporter, um, the news reporter firstly go to the meteorological agency for one year, and each day he, he or she don't come to your his or her office, but go to the JMA, and should I say that? news gathering. News gathering. Um, there's kind of news gathering from um, torrential rains, uh, eruptions, earthquakes, tsunami, and then go back to his or her office and news gatherings and experts. And also, uh, in NHK, all reporters are assigned to the local stations for the first assignment. And they uh, dedicate themselves to, uh, in, the, in the news gathering of disasters in each local stations. So this is a very big training, on-the-job training for reporters. And how about the producers? Yes. Thank you for your question. Um, as for the program production, I mean, the producers and the directors, uh, recently, uh, mm. uh, young students learn the science, uh, like me, as, uh, tend to uh, get a job at NHK to pro produce a science program. It's partly because it's not easy to get a job as a researcher <laughs> in scientific society. And uh, uh, there is a big chance to uh, express, uh, I mean, uh, not to. Uh, so uh, each producer uh, tends to uh, nurture their subjects or su their uh, goals to solve the uh, problems around the natural disasters by themselves through producing such kind of programs. Thank you. And uh, OK, um, the allocation of the budget for disaster prevention. Um, of course, NHK itself uh, ha doesn't have any mandate to do that. 
it's a government job. But we can propose, we can learn lessons from disasters and propose how to make the society more resilient or more stronger. So uh, this is a, a contribution to the society to make a correct allocation of the budget of the government for the future, we believe. So of course, together with the government, we discuss many times how to make a resilient society. And through these discussions and uh, um, uh, exchange of views, uh, we can contribute for such field too. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Salahuddin Ahmed from Bangladesh. I work in a radio station as a producer and deputy director general of Bangladesh Betar, Betar means radio. So in my country, you know, uh, frequently earthquake, typhoon, cyclone, and others disaster hit naturally frequently. In my country, uh, the real-time uh, real early warming and real-time news gathering is very difficult because we have no enough uh, facilities to provide information in the real sources. So uh, it is very um, casualty in the disaster time. A lot of casualties will be uh, uh, happen in frequently in main in our country. You know. So I ask you, what is your plan, or uh, do you have any plan or program? to cooperation worldwide for the journalism, to the real information to give from Japan or your scientist or other platforms or scientist institutions like this, do you research in your country? Do you have any plan or program to share the information for the journalism platform, journalism institutions worldwide togetherly, but in inter-country uh, 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 share the, your information? Do you have any plan or program? Uh, Japanese govern government has its agency for official aid, and uh, it's called JICA, Japan uh, International uh, Cooperation Agency. My son is working for. <laughs> and uh, through JICA, uh, we sometimes receive uh, our colleagues from many countries to share the experience and information. So uh, one thing is to uh, talk with JICA. And uh, maybe um, if uh, you can get the uh, financial uh, cooperation from JICA or Japanese government, then uh, we can do um, something. But uh, we ourselves don't have such kind of um, budget or uh, mandate. So uh, through JICA, we can cooperate. And also, um, we will try our best to cooperate with ABU to share our experience in the future, too. Yes. Yeah, perhaps. Just uh, relevant to what uh, Hashimoto-san said, perhaps uh, ABU is now exploring the possibility of um, establishing uh, a kind of archive or library uh, collecting uh, content from available sources in order to uh, share with broadcasters, ABU members, not necessarily for the broadcasting purposes because of copyright, which that could also be sorted out by the copyright holder. But necessary is to uh, share the knowledge among broadcasters, and I'm sure that uh, valuable materials available in NHK in all sorts of content, education, awareness building, and knowledge would be uh, a serious uh, uh, resource for the ABU. So we hopefully we are looking into that, and sometimes this year, we will see how we can deliver. Good morning, Hashimoto-san. 
Riaz said, uh, said came of, uh, Fiji Broadcasting. I was uh, especially interested in the fact that you were using, um, you, or you did use school students to gather a lot of information for, for the TV channel. Uh, my question is uh, twofold. One is, uh, was it an initiative of NHK itself to use students, or was it uh, done uh, with the blessings of the government or the Ministry of Education? And two, if it, either, in either case, uh, were there other instances in NHK where students were used for other research-related work? The research of the, by the students in the Aizu city, uh, that was initiated by NHK. It's not related to uh, local, local government, so uh, we initiated. Um, the advantage of using student is high attention of the local people. Uh, if a scientist suddenly makes questions to the uh, local people, they don't answer because they are not aware of that person. Who is this guy? Why this is he, does he make so many questions to us? But if the high school student of the local uh, area ask questions, people are willing to answer to pro provide uh, information, real information. So this is a big advantage by uh, using students in that program. Uh, this is a special case. We don't do this kind of research using students in other areas. But of course, depending on the uh, individual uh, case, uh, we can uh, do this, the same thing, for other purposes too. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, uh, very informative and helpful uh, presentations. Uh, this is uh, Penny again from the National Disaster Management Office here in uh, Fiji. Uh, we work uh, closely with our media stations, uh, FPC, who's here today. I think we have some Fiji TV guys who are in the, in the room. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of the context of uh, the media industry in uh, Japan, so I'm not sure how many uh, media stations, and it, it's probably much bigger compared to what we have here in Fiji. But this is this is one NHK is one, and it's doing a very good job in uh, disaster risk reduction work. Uh, from uh, a disaster, a government disaster management perspective, uh, I guess my question is: uh, Is this the the work that you're doing in Japan? Is this something in disaster risk reduction? Is this something that's uh, that you can find only with NHK, or do is it something that's consistent with all your with all your competitors in the in the media industry? Uh, because much of the work in uh, um, ensuring that content is consistent lies with the disaster management office in Fiji in this case. So there's there's challenges. So I guess that's that's my question. And any comments from the panel? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, Okay, in Japan, uh, we have uh, many commercial broadcasters too, uh, more than 100 broadcasters, commercial broadcasters, and uh, mainly five national wide, nationwide networks, and NHK. And they are also doing a very good job in time of disasters because uh, information, real time information provided by JMA is a common asset for the people. So not only NHK, but other commercial broadcasters, 
uh, can also use the same information from JMA. So they are doing the same thing uh, in the t uh, in emergency case. But if we compare NHK to the uh, commercial broadcasters, we have some advantage because we are uh, public broadcasters and we have no commercial, we have no sponsors. Our sponsor is uh, Japanese people, all Japanese people. So in case of disaster, we can easily change whole regular programs into emergency news immediately and continue broadcasting emergency news for days, weeks, sometimes months. But commercial broadcasters, it is not easy to change the programs because each program has their sponsors individually. So maybe in terms of programming, flexible programming, a uh, public broadcaster has a big advantage to serve the people to save lives. Well, I'm Patricia and I work in communications for the COP23 Secretariat. My question is related to the NHK app and it's uh, threefold. So firstly, um, the first question is, with the, uh, with the maps and the data that is displayed on the app, is that absolutely raw or is that in some way reformatted for that, uh, so that the end users uh, are able to understand? Is it a simplified version? Secondly, um, in 2011, um, the disasters in Japan inspired Facebook to develop their safety check-in uh, feature. Is this something that's integrated into the app itself so that users can also check in through the app to let you know that they're okay? And thirdly, when users communicate directly to you whether they do or don't through the app, is that something you then share with your um, rescue and recovery services to help um, get help out there to people who are affected. Thank you. それから、2問目は、えっと、あの、安否情報とあのアプリはリンクしてるんでしょうかというのが。それから3つ目は、えっと、あの、え、アプリは、え、あの、助けてくれとか、今ここにいるから救助してくれとかっていうレスキューを求
the rescue call cannot be uh, issued through this application. That is a different thing. So maybe people tend to use Twitter to uh, issue such kind of uh, uh, information. Thank you. My, my name is Matai, and I'm a former producer presenter. Um, being a former news director for FBC, we normally sit in the disaster um, uh, team, and FBC used to be the sole media that government used, but there's a lot of players now. We have the uh, Met Office, we have Nandraki, there's a, you know, so. Um, I don't know whether NHK is still the sole a source for information that goes out when it comes to disaster, or whether people are listening to so many other things. Uh, I see that because uh, previously we've seen, you know, where people are watching uh, television, and uh, there's warning coming, you know, because of the rivers, and they get a shock that the water is seeping into the, their homes but there's no scroll going on the television to say that there's a warning. You know, so uh, that's why I'm interested in your early warning as well. If there's whatever's happening, it cuts across all uh, mediums, whether it be television, radio, uh, to warn everyone that there's uh, a cyclone or tsunami warning. And uh, I'll just take this opportunity to thank the minister who's here as well and his team and uh, Fiji Media, it might be something that uh, we need to sit and discuss how to move forward with, with plans for Fiji. Thank you. The, the question is, um, are you the sole, you know, the only medium that goes out, uh, talks about the early warning, uh, or are there other media? Okay, um, in, the in time of big disaster, uh, not only NHK, but also commercial broadcasters uh, carry out the early warnings from JMA. Because as I told you, uh, the information from JMA is provided not only to NHK, but for the public. So uh, every sta TV station or radio station can use it. But uh, in times of matter, um, actually, uh, people, Japanese people tend to watch NHK in time of disaster. So if our regular programs, just 10%, 12%, but if you have a big earthquake, then everybody turns switch to NHK, and our rating will uh, jump up to over 50%. So this is what we are. So this is uh, why I said, uh, information infrastructure of Japanese society. That is NHK. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your uh, questions. Uh, oh, okay, can, can I? Okay. Thank you very much for addressing in such an insightful way such a critical topic for our Pacific region. I'm Lisa Williams. I'm uh, with the Pacific Media Network based in Auckland. Uh, serving the, the Pacific communities through radio and also with an English language news service. Um, I have some comments based on the earlier questions, and I know time is running short, so I'll keep it brief. First of all, I think that we need to acknowledge that this is such a key and important topic that it may in fact change a little bit, or I would recommend that we do consider having a review segment of the previous theme of the ABU PMP when you go to next year's PMP. So that the important threads and recommendations of these sessions can be picked up and followed up in that space. Just something worthy of consideration because I feel that it's such a heavy, it's such a big topic and we're addressing it in a room that is in fact truth be told, a bit of a bubble, eh? We want to be inclusive. We're talking about inclusive engagement, diversity, and that. And there are stakeholders that, you know, 
didn't have the time or the funding or the scheduling to be here. So in order to grow that engagement and make sure our messages today get out to those stakeholders, I'd recommend that we do consider having that review session next year to ensure that all the threads that we are picking up here don't get dropped, because it is so important. I also want to um, remind us that Japan being the developed power that it is, and the influence and the partnership that it enjoys in this part of the world and we enjoy with it has meant that we do have national broadcasters that have had weatherproof, future-proof buildings funded by the government of Japan, which raises for me an opportunity to see that where we can build on that. For example, Tuvalu, who's not represented here, the national broadcaster, public broadcaster of, of Tuvalu has a beautiful building. It's one of the best government buildings you see in the Pacific, built by Japan. Cyclone proof, built for climate change. But on the programming side and working on the messaging and the great initiatives you've got here, perhaps there is room to build on that partnership with Japan and bring in NHK through some innovative partnership involving ABU to help to, I wouldn't say replicate, because it's difficult in the developing Pacific to get the staff to go off and attach to a Met office for one year. Great if it happens, but the reality is they just don't have the resources to do it. But to adapt as much as they can from what you've provided here, because it's great engaging stuff. Just one more comment, just one more comment. Japan also funded the ICT center at USP in Suva. ICT, the development of apps, is such an, it's a golden opportunity for us to explore. We have a Pacific network of um, the Internet Society that perhaps could assist um, broadcasters to engage with the science communicators and get an app together. That helps us to um, put the early warnings out as well. And lastly, the colleague from UNDP raised uh, another question, and this resonated from yesterday. How do we as media get the messages from science, communications, all that jargon across. I think the question can also be reversed. And we say, how can we, how can those communicators get their science and jargon through to those who engage to the, with the public, which is the media? So it's a question that cuts both ways. And for example, there is, I believe, currently a huge communication science summit happening across the other side of the world where media are not involved. Later on this year in Dunedin at the University of Otago, there is a science communicator symposium happening. They had room to run one workshop. The workshop was booked out. You can't get in anymore. And it costs hundreds to attend. But it's just these kinds of spaces where we as broadcasters and media can perhaps engage a bit more and keep talking to each other as well as those who aren't in the room who are doing important work. The regional network of the National Disaster Management people, the agencies such as SPREP who are also working with PIDF on climate change and issues like that. Um, there have been so many initiatives that have happened and commitments and this is where I see in a room with the, with the PMP and our Asia family here that those commitments can walk the talk, and we see it happening so beautifully in NHK. So I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now time is running out, so I have to conclude. Um, thank you for your precious comments. And uh, today, we have discussed how we should improve our disaster reporting uh, for, the, for the audience. And actually, disasters are becoming more violent year by year due to the climate change. And the role of broadcaster is also becoming more important. So let's share uh, and exchange our experience each other among ABU members so that we can improve our capability to serve our audience better for the future. Thank you very much. Hashimoto, thank you very much, and to your team. An excellent presentation, as always. Thank you. Um, well, that concludes our first session today. Um, we have overrun a little, but if you go for a break now, it's uh, 10 to 11. We shall reconvene at quarter past 11 for our final session on this particular chapter. So quarter past 11, please, we'll start the next session. Thank you.
Do we have the panellists for the next session? Hello, Tantri. How are you? Good. Good. You? Very well. Thank you. How long a presentation do you have? So we're just wishing one panelist. Is Ravin Kumar uh, around? Have we seen him? from the Fiji Met Office. That's all right. How are you? This my minister got her. That's okay. <laughs> could you, could you? Thank you. Sit at the end. That's all right. Just look at the end. All right. Okay, that's it. If people outside are still slurping their coffees, we'll allow them to do so outside. Uh, we'll start this uh, final session of this first chapter. Um, and as you've seen from your programme, this is developing a broadcast plan. Now, what we try to do is obviously when we leave these conferences, we try, we try to assemble some sort of legacy. Um, and, and coming up with a plan, a template that is for broadcasters, is something that we believe is essential for the future. It is a document that we can look back at. And it is something that you as broadcasters uh, and other institutions can look at. And it's like a checklist. Um, of, of things that we should have in place, or perhaps could have in place. Um, and, and that's what this session is about. So we have a, a selection of panellists here. It's almost like a, a geographical tour of the region, uh, looking at their um, uh, examples, looking at their experiences. But more than that, we want contribution from you during this session, um, because th th there are basic questions that we, that we ask, uh, and that is, do you have a broadcast plan in place. And if you don't, why not? And even if you do, are you happy with it? Is, it? is it a plan that actually works? Is it a plan that your staff 
buy into? Do they understand it? We've had this wonderful masterclass from NHK, and there's more to come from NHK in this session also. Um, so we see them almost as a sort of a gold, uh, a gold standard. It's something that we can all aspire to. We don't all, of course, have the same sort of resource as they have, um, but at least they can set an example to which we can, we can aim at. Now, as we're in Fiji, perhaps it's relevant to begin with the question, um, what, 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 what steps do Fiji Broadcasting and, and Fiji TV have in place? Um, and and, and I, I, I know we have uh, Niten Prasad here, who is uh, Director of Technical Ops at FBC. So if we can get um, a microphone to him. Where is he? Right? Yes, he's there. Could we, could we, could we get a microphone to um, Nitin Prasad there? Do, do, do you want to just tell us what, what, um, what do you have in place in Fiji? Is, 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 it, is it a robust system that, uh, that you have faith and confidence in? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning to all. My name is Nitin Prasad, and I'm the Director Technical at Fiji Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, just just uh, going back uh, a little bit into uh, a bit uh, detail in what uh, FBC is about. Uh, FBC is a public service broadcaster. We have two uh, public service uh, broadcasting stations, which is Radio Fiji 1 uh, in uh, Aitoki language, and uh, Radio Fiji 2, which is uh, in uh, delivered in Hindi. Uh, apart from that, the uh, other... Uh, we have another four FM, uh, four stations, which are commercial uh, stations. So the, the, those are namely uh, Gold FM, uh, Bola FM, Today FM, and Mirchi FM. Uh, on top of that, um, uh, last year in uh, uh, late August, uh, early August, we had a fourteen million dollar project funded by JICA, the through government of Japan, uh, which has further enhanced our public service broadcast to the maritime areas uh, on uh, AM frequency, that's medium wave, uh, 558 kilohertz and 990 kilohertz. Uh, that has uh, added a, a major improvement in, in getting the, uh, the disaster management information out to the uh, public, especially on the maritime uh, islands. Uh, as, as, uh, Many of you, or most of you, would have, uh, I mean, are aware that uh, Fiji comprises of about more than 330 small islands, and uh, the 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 geographical layout is such that we are not fully able to provide coverage to the uh, to the people on the outer islands so on FM frequency. So there was a much need in getting an AM, a reliable AM uh, system done. Uh, which uh, was again funded by JICA for, for that purpose. Uh, yes, we, we do have a uh, DRR in uh, place. So in, in terms of natural disasters, uh, with, uh, and as it happens or when, when does it occur, uh, we, are, uh, we, we put this DRR in, in uh, action. Uh, so during... Uh, uh, Pre-disasters, pre uh, the Gold FM station, which is our uh, hub, or the common uh, station, which uh, becomes like a centralized uh, dissemination of information to the general public, uh, we have hourly bulletins on that as well uh, with the updates. Uh, and again, it uh, gets del delivered into three languages, uh, English, Hathaki, and Hindi. And, uh, we do a sample broadcast as well on the AM frequencies. So the uh, reach is again both covered, uh, I mean, the reach is extended to the maritime uh, areas. And in, in that way, the people on the maritime uh, uh, islands uh, areas, which is uh, our, our main target, like they are some sort of like, uh, not in regular communication or in, in touch with the, what's going on around in the world. So we are able to bridge that gap and provide those relevant or key information in, uh, during disasters or before disasters and keep them updated on, on all aspects of life, what's going on in Fiji and around, around Fiji and in the world as well. So uh, as mentioned earlier, they are our uh, hourly bulletins of the weather updates and if there is a uh, real emergency, if we are um, in the midst of a cyclone, uh, there is special bulletins as well which uh, provides uh, uh, updates the uh, update uh, 
the general public on the current situation, where to go, what to do, what not to do. Uh, the uh, NDMO again works hand in hand with the Fiji Broadcasting Corporation as well, uh, coming up with the, the, the nearest evacuation centers for the uh, key areas or communities around, around Fiji. So, so your standard operational procedures are in place and your staff are well trained in them. And if I was to ask any of your staff now, they'd be happy to say, yes, we are trained, we know what, what we have to do. Yes, it's, it's in place, but I would say we can do much better uh, in, in terms of improving our overall efficiency in, in getting the right message uh, to the general public and at the right time. I, I think that's, that's the answer that we find across the region. Yes, yes but. And, and it's the but that causes the problem, if you don't mind me saying so, with all due respect. I'm yep. sure that you do have these, these standard operation procedures in place. It is the updating, it is the continuous training, it is making sure that everybody is singing off the same hymn sheet. We have actually been to a country, Natalia and myself, um, and one of those countries told us, yes, of course we have our standard operational procedures in place. More than that, we have two different copies of them. Now. That in itself is not something to be proud of, is it? Because you then ask yourself, which set of standard operational procedures do people implement? So I think most broadcasters in this room would say exactly the same. Yes, we're, we're confident. But, and the but, when you come down to it, is it updated? Is it constantly being fed to the, to the staff, those who can implement it finally? I, just one quick word, are you confident in that sense? And this is not a personal indictment. This is something that I think is, is common to most broadcasters. Yes, uh, we are confident. Right. Uh, I mean, again, coming to conferences as such, uh, this one, it, this is a real eye-opener for us, and not, not only in terms of uh, learning new techniques uh, from, uh, from the other regional areas, such as uh, Japan, uh, the NHK does a great job. I mean, they, they are the public service broadcasters of Japan as well. Uh, and uh, other, uh, like uh, getting getting more information as such, uh, we'll again, uh, we can take it back into our own companies and uh, it, sit down and talk about it and then implement it. Good. It's sounding like a school report, isn't it? Good, but can do better. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, Natalia, uh, Natalia Leva from ABU. Can, can we get a microphone down here, please? Um, because I'd like Natalia, please, to tell us a little bit more about what we expect from SOPs, from, from our standard operational procedures, um, before we go around and, and hear more from our guests here. Standard operational procedures. Uh, broadcasters, normally journalists, probably don't know about them. People from international agencies that work on disasters are into them in a big time. This is a document that has been prearranged, agreed, and everybody knows about it. The reason is to save time. So when something happened and Met Office says, oh, you have to issue this warning, whoever is on duty doesn't go to the boss, doesn't go to the top editor. He knows or she knows what to do. And we have been in several countries. They didn't have it. And then, then they introduced just one page. If you're on duty and you have this and this and this, you immediately interrupt normal broadcast. You immediately ask the emergency team to come to the newsroom to have breaking news. And that works very well. There is no need 100 pages. It's one simple page. Who is doing what when you have the warning? Uh, and I think that's enough because we can talk to you tomorrow about standard operational procedures. But uh, this is crucial because it saves sometimes hours. We had one example when the Met Office knew what was going on and the news was going up to the boss, up to the ministry, four hours gap. They missed the time when the fisher, uh, fishermen go to sea to warn them, and they lost 65 people. So if they had the standard operational procedure, 
whoever received the news would have issued the fishery bulletin immediately. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Natalia. Yeah, the relationship between, as, as, as we've seen o, o, over the uh, yesterday and today, the relationship between the stakeholders, between between partners, is vital. Um, and, and as Natalia was pointing out there, we, we've we've been to places where the Met Office do not actually communicate with the broadcasters. So we've heard of. Fiji Broadcasting and what, that they are happy uh, with what they have in place. Can I can I can I ask therefore for the um, Met Office officer from Fiji um, to come and uh, present his his take on, uh, on 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 how the relationship works here in Fiji between the Met Office and the broadcasters. Thank you. Um, I will share very briefly the experiences that we have gone through in the last couple of years, especially making a good relationship uh, with the media industry here in Fiji. First of all, uh, we need to know what we need to do or how to react at an appropriate time so that the information that we have on hand is really goes down to the people they need. And this is something that we have built on. And we saw during Tropical Cyclone Winston, and prior to that, Tropical Cyclone Pam when affected Vanuatu, the communication uh, from weather office to the media industry was not regular. We built up from that one and improved during Tropical Cyclone Winston, and we brought the broadcasting ahead seven days in terms of letting people know what is happening in terms of atmosphere and ocean and what we expected. And then we continuously provided an update through the media release to all the media outlets, print, radio, as well as TV, so that the message is consistent. And we also followed up in terms of wherever we thought there was a shortfall through a telephone to see that the radio stations are broadcasting. And we come live on the stations to see that it has been given from an authoritative voice what is going to be expected. Therefore, the planning process was very critical for us, how we're going to deliver. And we put up a very simple communication strategy. And that was to provide this information at least two to three days of ahead. And when the alert goes out, people should get at least two daylight hours to prepare and our warning should be out there at least 24 hours before the imminent disaster is expected to affect the communities. So based on that, we started off continuing today. We are doing that with the current systems that we have been going through for the last uh, couple of days, uh, almost a week. We have been putting out the media releases, contacting our stakeholders, especially in the media industry, and everybody is getting the same information. So, uh, first of all is the SOP which has been discussed and it is very critical. It's not only to be at the broadcasting stations, but also we need to see that it's consistent and it's a time bound how we're going to react from one step to the other so that we do not miss out on the timings. And any very good information doesn't go out on time, it's just a waste of that information. And where we can see the casualties, loss of life and property can happen. So again, looking back at the NHJ and KH presentation, fear co correctly and perceive correctly is very key. And the t uh, accuracy and timing and making people to rely on you with reliable information. At the same time, it must be coming out from the authoritative voice to see that they can trust you. It is a government-driven process, and this is, has to be within the, uh, uh, the process and procedures of the government. And I also reiterate that the loss of time should be minimized, because these early warnings really have time as an essence. And if any bureaucracy is stopping, uh, probably we need to see that how best we can uh, go around it and see that if it needs to go this hour and if I have to take certain approvals and if I have to bypass, I should be able to do that. So time is of an essence. We need to see that 
SOP incorporates some of those bureaucracies that we may have to go through, which may delay, and the critical information is held, and people get affected on the ground. I also see that uh, the early warning systems, especially there are a number of players in the market, they would like to gather information, make it a breaking news. It's not a question of breaking news, it's a question of providing credible information from the authoritative voice that is mandated to provide that. And this really have to see that it comes through the government process that we have those that are only authoritated to talk on certain things, to provide information on certain things to the media organizations, we, they, they do in a timely manner. We also considered how the content of this information should be packaged so that it provides them sequencing in terms of what, what does the uh, clouds do or through the satellite pictures, what the current precipitation is or the rainfall is on the ground, and what are some of those diagnostics that we see that is going to lead us towards the uh, better communication of those information in time sequencing. The need for a checklist is absolutely essential. What I should do when, and how I should achieve that, and when it should go out to National Disaster Management Office, as well as to the uh, broadcasting stations. And once we have that implementing those processes, getting it done in the right way, that needs some transitional phase. So what we are implementing right now to see that we are able to better serve our nation. We have set up a media center in Nandi because the TV stations are in Suva, so that if there is a time for emergency we need to cross live or do a live streaming, we should be able to do so. So this work is in transition, is in process, and by end of this, this year we should be able to have that facility to go in. We have trained our uh, meteorologist and climatologist to be a weather broadcasters. This was done by World Meteorological Organization over a one-week program, and we'll be running up more of those with the TV broadcasters, radio broadcasters, as well as the meteorologist, so that we see that we have a pool of trained broadcasters and meteorologists who can talk about the issues on natural disasters and the impending uh, uh, difficulties that we may have. And at the same time, we, after the tropical cyclone Winston, we just uh, did a small survey, and that was provided by the Fiji Disaster Resilience Council. Most of the younger generation were hooked on social media, about 50% of them. So we have also introduced putting up uh, posts on the social media, and, uh, we've seen, and also we are putting a small video clips where the forecasters are actually doing a weather presentation and putting out on that. And some of those are hitting about 8,000, 10,000 people reach. Uh, one of those media releases that was posted two days ago, uh, last night I saw it was about 37,000 uh, people reached. So it is making, a, we're making small steps but reaching out to the people. So. Um, with this, uh, this is the experiences that we have gone through, and I think it's a good learning experience. We are not yet there. We're taking small steps at a time, and time will come that we will need. We need resources. We need specialized people. We need uh, continuous capacity development to be going uh, so that we can achieve the objectives of communicating this very important aspect in terms of climate change as a reduction and communication to our general public. Thank you. Thank you, Robin Kumar. That's, that's very good. Thank you very much indeed. And if I could now ask uh, Takanobu Tanaka, please, uh, once again uh, from NHK, um, let's have a listen to, to their experiences. Thank you. Um, my presentation will focus on the history of NHK's disaster broadcast. And in the previous session, uh, NHK Masterclass, my colleagues introduced some of the latest advancements of NHK's disaster broadcast. And having seen that, I'd like to talk about how NHK has come to have such a system. And my assignment from Natalia is to tell you Rome was not built in a day. 
And in fact, NHK has a long history of disaster broadcasting. And actually, NHK was established in 1925, two years after the great Kanto earthquake, which devastated much of the Tokyo metropolitan area. And one factor that led to the establishment of NHK was that during the earthquake, there was a tremendous chaos due to a false and harmful rumors. So government at that time recognized the importance of accurate and proper information in times of disasters. So in a sense, NHK was born with a mission of disaster broadcasting. And just to give you some ideas of disaster casualties in the past, in 1945, one typhoon killed more than 3,700 people. In 1947, another typhoon killed nearly 2,000 people. So as you can see, we have experienced huge loss of lives one after another. And in 1959, Issei one typhoon hit the central part of Japan, Nagoya area, and there was a huge storm surge up to the height of about four meters, and more than 5,000 people were killed. And this became the turning point for NHK's disaster reporting. Previously, NHK's disaster coverage was generally to report on the damage after a disaster. But after Issei 1 typhoon, our focus has shifted to reporting in an effort to minimize damage and reduce casualties. So in the wake of the huge loss of human lives by Issei 1 typhoon, disaster countermeasure basic law was enacted and NHK was designated to disseminate information to prevent disasters by working with government and other related organizations. And as you can see in this graph, by developing a better disaster management system, the number of victims has dramatically declined. The highest bar on the left is in 1959, uh, when Isewan Typhoon hit Japan. And since then, the number of victims have been lowered. And until we had a huge earthquake in Kobe in 1995. So this proves that if we work properly, if we co convey the right message to the people to make the right decisions, we can save lives. Now let me now tell you a little bit about NHK's disaster reporting system. Since Isewan Typhoon, NHK has been collaborating with the Japan Meteorological Agency. They monitor and gather data. And NHK is linked online with JMA. So, for example, when JMA issues a warning, it comes directly to NHK, and NHK can broadcast it simultaneously. And in order to broadcast the warning simultaneously, we have developed the automatic visualization system. The graphic on the upper left shows the seismic intensity, shows how strong the tremors of the quake were in those dotted areas. And the graphic on the upper right is the map of Japan showing the areas where the tsunami warning is being issued. And it is amazing that even announcers' comments are automatically made. I think this helps news presenters tremendously. I used to be a news presenter, and when I was young, I had to memorize everything. I have to practice again and again to make right comments even off the top of my head. So NHK has developed and strengthened its disaster broadcasting system following the bitter experiences of disasters. Let me give you one example. There was a volcanic eruption in Kyushu, southern island of Japan in 1991. Um, lava dome was destroyed uh, by the eruption and the volcanic rocks and ash rushed down toward the nearby towns and 43 people were killed, including two NHK staff. And for TV, visual image is crucial. Somebody has to shoot the disaster. So, 
This triggered, this tragedy triggered NHK to increase the number of remote control cameras nationwide. And this was really useful in 2011 tsunami disaster. You probably remember much of the footage of tsunami was captured by those remote control cameras. And another example is the earthquake in Kobe in 1995. More than 6,000 lives were lost. And there were many lessons learned from the earthquake in Kobe, but one important progress was lifeline information, which was introduced in the master's class. Uh, NHK sends out information on lifeline, like gas, electricity, water supply, hospitals, transportation. And the uh, basis for lifeline information was formed through the experiences of Kobe earthquake. Because many people lost their houses, they have to live in evacuation centers, tentative houses for a long time. So we have to give those people in need the right information. What about the improvements after March 11 tsunami disaster? In the master's class, my colleague introduced the social listening team. Let me tell you one factor behind the establishment of social listening team. In large-scale disasters, it is always very difficult to know exact locations of disaster hit areas and scale of damage. And for example, these were the areas NHK covered on the afternoon of the second day in 2011. Red is areas we covered on the ground. Yellow is the areas we covered by helicopters. And blue is areas we covered by remote control cameras. But there were areas where NHK did not cover or could not cover much, such as Minami Sandik Town. And these were the pictures of Minami Sandik Town I took one year after the tsunami. And you can see that almost the whole town was washed away by the tsunami. Now, we think that if you check photos on the social media, you could get a better picture of the disaster. So, we set up the social listening team, and their task is to observe social media traffic 24-7. And of course, to bridge the last mile to reach everyone in need, we use all the media platforms available as introduced in master's class. But besides such digital technology, I'd like to note that during the 2011 disaster, NHK provided about 500 television sets at evacuation centers, and for the areas that were without electricity, we provided 9,000 radios. So, improvements of disaster reporting system is like a cycle. When a disaster occurs, we do what we need to do to save lives and property of the people, and we support recovery and reconstruction. But in quiet time between disasters, we review a broadcast to find some ideas about what we can improve on. And one other thing I'd like to underline. No matter how sophisticated your disaster broadcasting system is, it's worthless if you don't know how to use it. And it's not just you, but every staff in your station must know because you never know when the disaster occurs. Maybe it occurs when you are taking a day off. So this, pic this is a picture of a drill to practice emergency broadcasting. Now we conduct drills regularly so that everyone knows what to do in case of disaster. So I hear many people praise NHK's coverage of the Great East Japan earthquake, but I think what we did on March 11th was based on what we had planned, what we had prepared, and what we had been trained to do. So, to conclude, broadcast plan is a message to the next generation. But there's no final, complete plan or the perfect plan. It is always in the process. We have to revise it, improve it, to fit the changing environment natural environment, social environment, technological environment, climate change.
And finally, we need to know how to implement, it, implement the plan properly. So train yourself to be ready for the next disaster because information can save lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanaka. There we are. It comes, comes from the man himself. There's, um, there's no perfect plan, not even in Japan. Let, let's hear um, uh, from the Solomon Islands. Um, Roland, uh, if you're willing to come up and, and talk about um, your salient points from, from the experiences of the Solomon Islands. Um, head of presentation is Roland in SIBC. Hello, uh, everyone. Um, on behalf of SIBC, I'd like to come and also present uh, kind of a SOP that we have uh, during times of disaster. Solomon Islands, maybe for others who do not know, we are in the Pacific, just about three hours flight from Fiji to the Solomons. Uh, and uh, we are also prone to disasters as well. SIBC, um, is a public broadcaster, uh, the only public broad broadcaster in the Solomons. We have other radio stations. We have at least four commercial stations that are there as well. They transmit on FM, so they didn't reach the rest of the country. SIBC, we transmit on uh, short wave frequency, which covers the entire country. Also on FM, which uh, covers the, the around Honiara and also surrounding islands and we are live streaming as well. But firstly, just to go through uh, what we have during a disaster. Now, this is just an introduction, like SIBC is the most important task as the national broadcaster, is to keep our listeners informed about and prepare for you know, disasters like storms, cyclone, earthquake, landslides, before, during, and also after a disaster. And because radio is a point-to-multiple point medium, uh, it is expected that warnings and other important messages are heard in more than 5,000 villages and towns across the country. Our population is roughly about 700,000 plus, and they depend much on radio for information. And about 80% of our population lives in rural areas, about 20 or so in urban centers. So that's the chain of communication that you've seen on the screen there. We rely on NDMO, uh, sorry, firstly with, uh, from Solomon Islands Med Services, our weather office. They're the ones who actually gather the information, they spot whatever situation, and then they pass the information to NDMO. Now NDMO, within the NDMO they have a National uh, Emergency Committee, which is the NEOC. They are the ones who analyze uh, the information and the risks that associate with whatever event that occurs. And then from there, NDMO passes that information to SIBC. We sort of uh, tailor the information so that it suits the public understanding. And then from there, it goes through the radio, live streaming, to our listeners. Now, our listeners uh, can also um, report whatever uh, they've seen or the experience that they have. We also have a text, uh, text in uh, mechanism there so that wherever they, they live, whatever occurs, they can also text in. And uh, if they want to know more about what the, situa uh, what, what, the, what the situation is like, they can actually text, text in. Uh, their, their messages or their comments. That's the standard SOP there. So in an event of an impending disaster, firstly, the operations manager and the programs uh, manager upon receiving that advice from the NDMO, they alert the chief engineer. Now, this is if that uh, disaster occurs 
after 11 p.m. until 6 a.m. Uh, we closed down for transmission on our shortwave frequency from 11 in the night till 6 in the morning, and then we opened the station back at 6 o'clock. Now, if there's an event that occurs during that time, the chief engineer will be the first to be contacted. He turns on the, our shortwave uh, transmitters to broadcast immediately. And then from there, if it occurs during the day or during the broadcast hours, then that's what you see there. It goes straight to the on a presenter. He broadcasts whatever information he's got from the NDMO. We rely on MEDS and NDMO. We also have external sources with information, but um, NDMO and NEOC, they are the ones who are responsible. They are the ones who know the, the uh, seriousness or the hazards that are harm to our public, so we use them as our source. We don't use external sources outside. We rely on them. But they are the, the ones who are mandated to provide that information. We also have, uh, in terms of gathering information, we have our stringers, kind of as correspondents that um, work in various provinces. They can also feed us with information. We also can get stories from eyewitnesses or victims wherever they live, and if they are affected, they can actually call in or they can text in their messages. We can get this information and then pass it back to NDMO for verification purposes. We also can have contact to police that are situated close to where the disaster is, and we can also have some first hand information from them as well. What you see on the left is, uh, that's a typical bulletin from our disaster office. That's how it is formatted. So they bring that information, and uh, we tailor that information to the understanding of our public. So that's from the National Disaster Council. Our broadcast uh, platforms are there. We have radio, live streaming. We are going to start TV this year too, so that would be an additional platform that we can use uh, during times of disasters. That's the National Disaster Network cluster. The one circle there in red, is that is where SIBC is with the national cluster a disaster cluster there. So SIBC sort of works very close with NEOC or the NDMO in terms of disaster. Also, working with uh, our National Disaster Office, uh, we also can have talkback shows. Talkback shows are very effective in the Solomons. That's when we have a panel. We have someone from MEDS. We have someone from NDC. We have someone from police. Whenever there is a situation that uh, arises, we have a talkback show. So this is broadcast throughout the country. You can either call in by phone or you can either text in. And then you interact with the, with the panel. <coughs> SIBC, we also have our own uh, hazards too. We are the center point to disseminate information, but uh, we'll, our location is disaster prone. We live by the sea. We live by a stream that sometimes gets flooded. We live close to police headquarters. And uh, these are some of the hazards that we face. Man-made hazards, we have a prison just uh, about 20 meters away. We have uh, police headquarters there as well. Um, and those are some of the hazards that we faced. And uh, to our left, there are, we have natural hazards. We have flooding, tropical cyclone, earthquake. These are hazards that we face as well. So what do we do? What is our backup plan if that occurs to us? So this is just an example of a response that will happen. For example, if it's an earthquake or a tsunami, what will happen is that uh, we broadcast that uh, information and then if we are under threat, that's what happened. We also have a backup studio at the NDMO office. So if our complex is flooded, or if something happens to the broadcast station, we have a backup 
uh, station up there at the NDMO. So they can actually broadcast directly from there to our transmitters. Or if there's an event that occurs and doesn't need time for the information to reach SIBC, they cut off our transmission and then they broadcast straight from the NDMO office to the general public. And uh, this procedure, we, we actually this SOP is a collaboration between SIBC, the NDMO office, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a standard plan that we use. In terms of uh, climate change and mitigation, uh, we, we work with stakeholders. We have some programs uh, there, as you have seen, environment programs, disaster awareness. Those are some of the programs that we, we produce. We actually go down to the rural communities. We hear their stories, bring their stories, and then we produce programs. And then we air it to our listeners as well. And uh, also, um, during our provincial tours, when we go down to the villages, we also provide radios to elders, like chiefs or church leaders in the communities um, where they don't have radio. Because uh, in the Solomons, uh, for example, if you have a village of 10 houses, maybe you have only one or two radios in each village. S some villages, no. So we also help out in you know, providing uh, radio to, to, to our listeners too that are, uh, are far from um, are areas that are not rich, uh, close to towns and, but also for times of disaster. We want our listeners to know. And uh, also I understand that uh, all, all the communities, they also have their SOPs in place and the MO has been doing great work, go down to village communities and they, they have their own SOPs like hitting a drum or blowing a conch shell if there's a disaster happens. And all the villages, they know where to, to gather uh, on a safe place uh, before they receive some more information from us or even from NDMO or the police. So thank you too much. That's just a very short and brief presentation. Thank you too much. Thank you, Roland. Okay, let's continue our journey. Let's go further north. Let's go to Indonesia. Um, and let's ask Tantri. Uh, Latami, please, to give us the situation in Indonesia, please. Thank you. Thank you. My presentation about disaster from media's perspective. <clears throat> With 97 stations in the territory of Indonesia, facilitated RRE to provide information, education, and entertainment to the public, especially in the event of a disaster. As the large media in Indonesia, RRI also has our social responsibility to prevent the occurrence of climate change and function as a media for disaster response. As a media for disaster response, RRI packed various programs on all stations, such as talk show, mini studio in disaster area, and meet RRI program care. To prevent climate change, RRE works with all its stakeholders, governments, and the public to broadcast programs such as green radio and a rural broadcast. Indonesia, world of regional languages will benefit RRE in the event of disaster because some RRE areas on remote island borders and outermost from Indonesia still use the local language and Indonesian language. 
Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Very short and sweet. Um, we'll continue our journey, moving on to Thailand. Darren, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Darren from Thai PBS. I'm a news, re uh, news reporter and also news editor and also anchors of Thai PBS. At first, I would like to tell you that uh, for Thailand, we used to believe that our country is a happy, safe place. We learned from when I was a kid, I was teach that um, Thailand is so safe. We have no disaster at all. So, you know, everybody in Thailand believed that. But uh, the idea was changed because of climate change for this around 10 years already. Uh, our viewers tends to uh, would like to know more about disaster. So we as Thai PBS, we are public broadcasters, try to give more information to the people. But for me, at first, I worked in Thai PBS for around 10 years. And it is, um, this year is the birthday of Thai PBS of 10 years also. Um, we work uh, on disasters around six years already, six, seven years. Uh, in 2011, when Japan uh, encountered tsunami and big earthquake, in that year, Tha uh, Thailand encountered big flood. And in that year, I working hard on uh, early warning and try to make um, people to know more about uh, what is the, the tense of um, flood that will enter to their home. And after that, in 2012, people still would like to know more about disaster. Now they know that Thailand is not a safe place anymore. So they would like to know more about disaster. But in Thailand, people and, and uh, all of the journalists believe that we can working on disaster only when it's happened. And what should I do? In 2012, Thai PBS uh, assigned me to produce a program, weekly program, about uh, disaster. We call it DRR program. And I'm working on that program for six years already. And this year, we think that we should improve it more. And now I show you a trailer of my new program, which will be broadcast in this March. Uh, it's a very long one, but I show you for around one and two minutes. So please. I explain to you also because it's in Thai. In our program, we use a lot of graphic information from academic scientific, scientific uh, data, but it is hard for people to understand. So we use a lot of real, real footage, and we try to make it more humanized for my program because otherwise people will feel boring about watching the uh, our program. This year, we would like to working on younger viewers also because we think that young generation can um, can be the future of our countries. So we try to select characters for our weekly program to be younger generation. And this is the stories of a young generation who survived from tsunami. He was two during that time. He have no memories about tsunami, but he was saved by his mother and his sister. So these uh, stories will be about his life and how he learns about tsunami and how the villagers in this area learns about it. Okay, this is some of uh, my trailer for, for my um, new version of the R program, and we call it now Don't Panic, okay? Okay, so this is my program, but 
I still have more dreams about working on disaster. Since I'm working uh, on disasters to be a specialist reporter for disaster for six years already in Thai PBS, I realized that if only Thai PBS working on um, disaster harder and harder, but it's not enough for Thai people to be ready to be more resilient to disaster. So now we hope that we can make more friends. We can share this kind of uh, motivation, inspiration to other journalists in Thailand. At first, I was inspired by NHK thanks to their spirits. I would like to give this kind of spirit to other journalists in Thailand also. I started working on um, other houses before to, to share this kind of spirit. I'm working with WHO and uh, NBTC, which is a um, regulator of all digital television and radio in Thailand. And we make a training program for, for the journalists in Thailand to working on road safety. Because, uh, you know, in Thailand, we are the second rank of the world who have um, the most death from road accident. So I show you the clips about my program. And after two years, I'm working on training journalists to be one-man journalists. We use this kind of device for them to film, to working on their own uh, work, and train them to understand, to have spirit of working for other people to save life on road safety. And last year, I'm working more on training people to be disaster journalists. I show you the clips and I'm telling you. This one is about road safety that I work with WSO, Thai PBS, and BTC. This is NBTC. So we hope that we will have a journalist network who are working on road safety to save more life from road deaths. So we make friends with many agency, uh, academics, and everyone that is a, a road accident network in Thailand. And we try to give them more information, more contacts, more people. This is all the um, journalists who learn from us. This is the um, executive producer of Thai PBS who come to train them to know more about road safety. We bring them to many places all around Thailand to learn more in the field because we believe that field trips can make them understand more than just talking in a room. So we teach them to use this kind of device. You will see mobile phone, selfie stick, and tripod can help them a lot to working on road safety anywhere, anytime that they want to. But you know, some of them are radio staff, internet, and a social network journalists. But now they can do as um, TV uh, reporters can do. They can film and working with everybody and we know each other. So now we have around 30 journalists in Thailand who working with all of this device. We call them one-man journalists of growth safety.
ียภาพสื่อด้านอุบัติเหตุทางถนนนี้นะคะก็เกิดจากความร่วมมือขององค์การอนามัยโลกกสทชไทยพีบีเอสและเครือข่ายด้านอุบัติเหตุทางถนนในประเทศไทยค่ะซึ่งก็มีเป้าหมายนะคะที่จะขับเคลื่อนและเพิ่มศักยภาพของผู้สื่อข่าวให้สามารถทําข่าวเรื่องของอุบัติเหตุทางถนนให้ดียิ่งขึ้นเพื่อส่งผลให้เกิดการเปลี่ยนแปลงลดจํานวนผู้เสียชีวิตจากอุบัติเหตุทางถนนลงนะคะจากปัจจุบันนี้อยู่ที่อันดับ2ของโลกให้ลดน้อยลงให้ได้มากที่สุดค่ะคือผู้สื่อข่าวที่เข้าร่วมโครงการเราเนี่ยไม่ใช่เด็กนิเทศศาสตร์ปีหนึ่งนะพวกเขาเป็นมืออาชีพแล้วก็เป็นมืออาชีพแถวหน้าของประเทศไทยแต่ว่าโครงการเนี่ยได้รับเกียรติจากทุกสำนักข่าวนะครับส่งผู้สื่อข่าวของตัวเองมาร่วมโครงการได้เรียนรู้มากขึ้นแล้วก็รู้สึกว่าปัญหาที่เราเผชิญอยู่ทั้งประเทศเนี่ยเป็นปัญหาที่เรียกว่าเป็นวาระแห่งชาติทีเดียวแล้วทุกคนให้ความร่วมมืออย่างดีมากนะครับโครงการนี้ผมมองว่าเป็นโครงการที่เพอร์เฟกเพอร์เฟกในเรื่องของประเด็นเพอร์เฟกในกลุ่มของกลุ่มเป้าหมายที่มาร่วมอบรมก็คือสื่อสารมวลชนครับเพราะว่าตอบโจทย์ในแง่ของการลดอุบัติเหตุว่าทํำยังไงเราถึงจะได้มองเห็นประเด็นที่มันชัดเจนมากยิ่งขึ้นกลุ่มเป้าหมายก็คือประชาชนการลดอุบัติเหตุนั่นเองครับนี่ก็คือความเพอร์เฟกของโครงการนี้เห็นทุกกระบวนการและได้ลงพื้นที่ปฏิบัติจริงด้วยครับการโดเซตี้นะคะก็เป็นครั้งแรกค่ะที่พิงได้ลงมือเขียนสคริปต์เองได้วางแผนงานเองแล้วก็ได้ถ่ายแล้วก็ตัดต่อทำทุกอย่างเองหมดให้ให้งานหนึ่งชิ้นน่ะเสร็จสิ้นด้วยกระบวนการของตัวเอง But now this is about training of disaster journalists we bring them to p a n g a that is was a site of tsunami And we teach them how to working on um, disasters. And this is all the people who dealing with disaster in Thailand. We introduce them to the journalists, other journalists, and make them understand more about what happening in in the scene, in the location. We introduce them to the victims from tsunami. This is Dr. Seri, who is a disaster ex expert of Thailand. He's talking about how to make people safe from tsunami, and he said we could not just wait for the alarms, the siren tower, but but the people in the the area should know and prepare themselves, and they will run for their life. This is the drills of the people in in the area. He said, even we have to run for hundred times for drill, it's better than we have no chance to run. And they prepare themselves for local people. Uh, we will not panic, but. We try to be prepared for disaster, and this kind of training bring them to see this kind of drill in the area also. การอบรมผู้สื่อข่าวภัยพิบัติเกิดขึ้นจากความร่วมมือของกสทชและไทย PBS. I am telling about the the training of journalists for disasters come from cooperation between Thai PBS and NBTC, who is the regulator of all the news media in Thailand. And also, we bring them to Phuket to learn more about other disasters, except from. Um, tsunami. Now they knows about earthquake from the Met uh, Office persons. They learn about weather report, how to read maps, how to understand the hard information from all scientists, and then they go to cover in in that Phuket area. To learn more about floods and everything that's happened in Thailand, and at last, they said they would like to be a network, a network of disaster journalists in Thailand, and we would like to expand more this year. This is the place of Panga. This bus was bring to inland for around two kilometers from. Uh, 
from tsunami. So now we have a decoration of our own decoration that all of these uh, journalists would like to be a partner of us and working together to give more information to the people of Thailand to learn more about how to be prepared, how to be more resilient to all of the disasters that may happen in Thailand. So we hope this will help us more. I can share more information. I can make people, local people, uh, prepare more to be safe from from everything that may happen to them. So our concept is safe life from disaster also. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Okay, well that concludes our, um, our presentations for now. Um, but within any broadcast plan, we have to ask the question, what happens if the disaster actually hits the broadcaster physically? So I'm, I'm going to ask Tanaka first of all, what, what, what is your backup plan, technically that is, if the disaster, say, hits Tokyo? It's Tokyo. Um, I really don't want it to happen, but we have to prepare for the worst. So we have made a plan to have Osaka Station, the western part of Japan, second biggest city in Japan, to serve as the main station in substitute of Tokyo Station. So that's your backup plan backup that goes plan to, to Osaka Station. Osaka. Yeah. So Second Osaka begins station. the center. But you've yeah. already thought of it. if it hits Tokyo, mm -hmm. you can do something in Osaka. Yeah. If you can use Tokyo Station, we have to go to Osaka Station. OK, yeah, thank you. Back. Not everybody can do that, of course. So the ABU have come up with, uh, you, some of you are probably aware of a radio in a box, um, which is basically uh, an emergency communication device, or it can be used as an emergency communication device. N Nadim, do you want to play a quick clip of radio in a box, so that, a short clip, so that people can see what it actually is, what it does? Okay, Nadim, do you want to give us just a quick um, explanation, quick, quick breakdown of its various uses so that people can understand why this is such a valuable backup tool that can be used within any broadcast development plan? Yeah, it's a, it's a fully-fledged portable FM radio station that comes in a flight case. Let me just walk while I'm speaking to the front. Yes. Um, we developed this after the 2004 tsunami together with uh, UNESCO. Um, it comes uh, with a FM transmitter, uh, audio mixer, uh, playback capabilities with, uh, from CDs or memory sticks. It can incorporate uh, input from microphones if you want to uh, announce anything over the radio. Comes with the antenna and uh, 50 meter feeder cable. Basically, if you can put it up about 10, 15 feet high, it can cover a radius of about eight to 10 kilometers. Yeah, that's the idea. And uh, so far, we have uh, uh, supplied about 22 boxes to different parts of the world. 
Mostly they are used in community broadcasting. Of course, disasters don't happen every day. But uh, the idea is if you can probably locate these in strategic locations with uh, low-cost battery-powered FM receivers, you could deploy this uh, in a few minutes, distribute this to the affected population, and use this device as a communication, emergency communication device. Normally what happens is in a disaster struck area, the regular broadcasting is down, towers are down, there is no form of uh, communication. You can deploy this uh, if you are trained probably in a few minutes, I would say uh, less than half an hour to set it up and uh, fire up a, a fully functional uh, FM radio station. As a recovery or let's say uh, information about relief information where uh, water is available, where food is available, probably run short programs to psychologically help the people who are affected. So that's the idea. Yeah. Nadine, thanks very much. Could, could you take the microphone to Faisea um, from Samoa? Because I know that um, Samoa have actually ordered a radio in a box. Now, could you basically explain to us, Faisea, please, why you think this will be useful for you? How does it fit into your plan? Um, thank you. I think it's one of the best investments that we've ever made. Radio in a box will be very useful to ensure we continue our services in the event that our studio is hit by a tsunami because we are close, we're on a, the coastal area, uh, very close to the sea. So in the event that there's a tsunami that hits our area, we can just take this box, run up to the hill, and broadcast from there. So it's, I think it's, it's a must to have for every radio broadcaster. Thank you, Faisea. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Natalia, I mean, we're running out of time, I know, but at this stage, what, what can we offer to the broadcasters who are gathered here today? What, what sort of action plan can we offer them? What sort of help do you believe we have in store that, 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 that we can offer up today, that people can walk away from here and think, ah, that's the way forward? Uh, we have probably uh, received already the Fiji action plan that we are going to uh, work on, have your comments, and adopt at the end of the Pacific Media uh, Conference. And in this action plan, there is one part which tries to gather uh, support from our members where they want we to go next from here. And as Lisa was saying, we shouldn't leave it here. We should probably form a Pacific Islands uh, Climate Action and Disaster Preparedness Chapter to link to the uh, global process of uh, mitigation. And so far, we have identified several areas we would like to work, but it's up to you, of course. And it's up to each organization to say, oh, we cannot afford this, we don't need this. It is just like um, a menu, <laughs> what we can do. Uh, the first one is we would like to help whoever needs help in developing broadcast emergency plan with standard operational procedures, a way of linking to other stakeholders, trying to avoid delays in time, uh, and training people how to use all this. Uh, then we would like to work with um, uh, Met offices because um, weather presenters could be educators on climate change. But the practice is very mixed. In some countries, this is the stations. In other countries, this is the Met Office that is providing uh, weather presentation. And uh, Mr. Kumar was talking about one of the presenters being um, trained in, um, by World Meteorological Office. We can link Pacific to this because we have helped them to have our members in several courses which are our training weather presenters to be climate change communicators. What we are working also is what Darin has put in practice, training a critical mass of specialist journalists. Some nations that are totally 
uh, at risk of uh, climate change and disasters don't have even environment, environmental correspondent. And we are talking that we really have to have critical mass of good journalists that could tell the stories and teach people in a very creative and fascinating way how to save themselves. That's what was NHK saying, that you have to have you know, the, the digital, uh, the disaster literacy, if you don't have information to act yourself. Um, together with these goals, again, <laughs> Thai PBS, opening a space in our programs for such programs. Because that could be done in specialist programs, but that could be done in children programs as well because the children are the one that can educate their family and their uh, uh, Japan earthquake had several stories of children saving their families actually because they were drilled at school what to do and what not to do actually. And the last thing that we are working on is developing a pool of programs that UN agencies are producing and they're copyright free. Normally they are very good quality and they're uh, supporting the subjects that they're dealing with very well. And because uh, I think, it, Martin, it was Helsinki Convention when uh, all UN agency has to provide their programs free, I think, of charge. They're very happy to do that. Uh, we already do that with uh, United Nations Environment Program. Uh, we have distributed for World Biodiversity Day or World uh, um, Earth Day several clips, and now we are distributing something from for Valentine, you, uh, which is called Break Up with Plastic, and it's free. Anyone who wants it can come to me and it has different versions, different languages, and it's quite good. Can we play it? Not with you. This relationship isn't working. I'm breaking up with you. It's not me, it's you. You were always there for me, even when I was at my worst. But you created a toxic environment, not just for me, but others too. You were suffocating me. Also, I met someone else. I feel like I can breathe again. That's how I deserve to be treated. I have another option, and it's a healthy relationship. Um, it's good, isn't it? And we have um, several languages and different uh, length of this, uh, two minute, one minute, 45 seconds. So I'll disseminate to everyone in our list from this conference and you can broadcast it. Uh, another database we are trying to uh, develop is uh, in um, relationship to visualizing again, NHK, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, visualizing the effect of uh, disasters that we are broadcasting are coming. In Takluban, people that were wiped out didn't evacuate. They didn't evacuate because first in their language, sea search doesn't exist. People were saying sea search, but they didn't know what is sea search. And because ABU was assigned to evaluate the communication plan for this uh, area, Takuban, uh, we discovered that people said, if they have told us it is tsunami, we would have evacuated because they know what tsunami is. But sea search, we don't know what is this. And then we decided that it will be great if we have short clips of different disasters that Met Office, uh, the World Meteorological Organization, is happy to provide. 
and put it in our exchange platform so people can download what is for tsunami, what is for typhoon, different things, because then people can visualize it. I see it, I know what it is. So these are the several things we are working on and we are very happy if you approach us so we can help on anything and we together develop this. Thanks, Natalia. Um, well, I need to wrap up this particular part of the conference and bring the conference to an end, really. But I'd like to just back Natalia up on one of those major points by, by pointing to some of the quotes that we had yesterday. Um, we heard from the Prime Minister uh, from his address that he needs the media to scale up efforts. Um, Andy, Andy McElroy said uh, that uh, we need to be more proactive, not just reactive. The Attorney General said that journalists need to do more than just report the facts after they've happened. All this is very true. Yes, they do. But how? Big funding is needed to actually build capacity. Natalia stated in, in her opening statement that we need capacity building within the media. So that's what we're saying. Climate change has to be a speciality. Um, I think Darren has actually proven that himself. So, it doesn't just happen by osmosis. We need corporate policies that actually back us up so that we can actually change the media, that we can actually bring the media up to speed, and therefore all these desires can be fulfilled. So that would be, I think, our message as we bring it to an end. Um, I just want to thank you for this last day and a half. I hope you found it as interesting as I have. Um, we will, of course, be continuing after lunch, um, and uh, we'll be moving on, of course, to the Pacific Media Partnership Conference. So that begins officially at 2 o'clock. You can now go for an extended lunch, absorb what we've been saying in the last day and a half, clear the mind for a while, and move on to the new agenda this afternoon. Just before you leave, though, there are a couple of announcements, um, and that is uh, anybody who needs the airport transfer vouchers, please pick them up. Uh, these are the, the, for the people who provided uh, their departure details. You can pick these up from the registration desk. Um, and there is one other announcement, and this is good news because you're getting something for free. We are delighted to offer our delegates a memoir from Fiji in the form of commemorative postage stamps, including a first day cover. Now, these stamps were designed specifically for Fiji's presidency of COP23 covering the key areas. So all delegates uh, will receive a special gift pack during the lunch break. So there's a free present coming your way. Um, the one other thing that I'll remind you of is, of course, uh, the third ABU Awards on climate change and DRR. Um, that's happening tonight. There's a gala awards dinner, and of course, you're all invited there. So that's it from this part of the conference. This is the first chapter come to an end. Please join us after lunch at 2 o'clock for the second chapter. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.